Shalom, everyone. I'm Uncle Moshe. Next comes Take with Rabbi Doug. We're gonna see Rabbi Doug. We're gonna see Rabbi Doug. We're gonna see Rabbi Doug on your TV tonight. But Daddy, I wanna watch Monday Night Football. Forget about Monday Night Football. There's no other thing we're gonna watch on Monday but Rabbi Doug. Yeah, Rabbi Doug on TV tonight. We're going to see Rabbi Doug. Oh, how everybody talk about Doug? Shalom and welcome to Tape with Rabbi Doug. Glad you could be with us today. My guest today is Dr. Philip Caslow. Uh, welcome to Chicago. Thank you. He is a clinical professor of pediatrics at Columbia University, an attending physician and director of clinical gastroenterology at Children's Hospital of New York in Manhattan. And... Uh, I'm so glad while you're in Chicago that you're able to be with us here on the show. Uh, one of the wonderful things about Dr. Phil Caslow is uh, he is uh, my Dr. Oz and my Dr. Phil, and uh, he uh, really is an amazing man because he is also a Talmudic scholar and a teacher of Talmud and uh, Bible and Torah, and uh, along with all the other things he does, he studies on a regular basis as well, uh, you know, his, his Jewish heritage, and uh, really, uh, you are an amazing person, because you're one of the most intelligent person, people I've ever met in my life. Thank you. And, uh, you know, your, your rounded lifestyle and all the things you do are certainly amazing. Tell me, what is uh, gastroenterology? Gastroenterology is the study of the digestive system, in, in my case, in children's. We, the pediatric age range uh, in our hospital, at the very least, starts at birth, which can be even with a neonate in this day and age of modern technology. And we'll usually continue to follow patients through adolescence till approximately age 20 years. There are some patients who have childhood-based diseases that don't lend themselves easily to the work of an internist, so we'll continue to follow them into adulthood. But for the most part, we'll cut off care at about 18 years. And gastroenterology uh, takes care of the diseases of the digestive tract. Mm -hmm. And that also encompasses uh, questions of nutrition. Uh -huh. Tell me about uh, your, your education. You went to Yeshiva University. I'm a graduate of Yeshiva University. My medical school was the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. Following that, I did my training in pediatrics at Mount Sinai Hospital. I spent a year as a pediatric chief resident, followed by a fellowship in pediatric gastroenterology. I've been an attending physician at Columbia since 1986. Since 1986. Tell me, how does one decide on this as a specialty? First of all, people who are in the gastro field, okay, they decided to do that. How do you go into the, the pediatric? Now, would you be considered a pediatrician as well? Because We are all. And if anyone doing a pediatric subspecialty, which is what I do, mm -hmm. we're first trained in pediatrics. Mm -hmm. We're trained and then eventually board certified in pediatrics. Once we've done that, then depending on your proclivity, you may decide to specialize in a particular organ system. In my case, it was the digestive system. It's a good question as to why. I think many of us have been molded or shaped by personal experience. I know a very good friend of mine is a pediatric cardiologist because his oldest daughter had congenital heart disease. <clears throat> I think I was uh, gravitated toward gastroenterology because as a youngster, I had certain <clears throat> excuse me, digestive issues, and I always was particularly fascinated by the digestive system as well as the field of nutrition. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, that was where I decided to lend my expertise. Now, as a pediatrician, and especially as a uh, frum, Shomer Shabbos, uh, yeah. observant pediatrician in the Jewish community, do people walk over to your house on Shabbos and say, Dr. Keslow, my, my son has a terrible fever, uh, or, or, or the throat is so red, we don't know what to do. Do you get those things in your I get those calls and knocks on my door infrequently. Where I live in Teaneck, New Jersey, we are blessed with a plethora of observant health professionals so that everyone can seek out the person or specialist that they need. We have ophthalmologists, we have many general pediatricians, and they're the ones who will get the calls or the knocks for general issues. I will be approached infrequently, but not that rarely, if someone has a specific GI problem, such as bleeding from the intestine, some type of unusual case of 
recurrent vomiting, uh-huh. unusual stomach pains that seems to be beyond the scope of the general pediatrician. Those are the calls, emergencies that people will come. And again, being the type of physicians that we like to be, people know that our doors are always open. <clears throat> I'll just intercede with a uh, quote from the Mishnah in the end of Masechus Kedushin. It says, Tov Sheberofim Legehenim, which is a very difficult and problematical statement. It says, the good or the best of the doctors are destined to the netherworld. <clears throat> there are many different explanations as to what that means. The way I interpret it is that I view my work as a pediatrician as a calling, not simply as a job. And I am available to people who need me literally 24-7. Even here where I like to feel like I'm on Chicago, I have been receiving many calls from a number of colleagues and other patients. And there are many doctors here in the Chicago area who know when I'm visiting that they will discuss certain cases that they have with me. So Tov Shibrofim, the gematria, the numerical value of Tov is 17, meaning that if you don't always consider yourself as being part of that blessing of Rifa Enu, of healing us, then you are someone who is not a true physician. Well, that's kind of a doctors and rabbi thing. You can be on vacation, but you can't stop being a doctor. You can run, but you can't hide. And you can't stop being a rabbi and a from Jew. Um, there, there are so many pediatric issues that are in the news all the time, certainly. Um, and I just want to briefly touch these subjects because I really want to talk about the gastro field. Um, is there anything new in, in the secrets of SIDS? You know, people, we still have, you know, sudden infant death syndrome is still prevalent. You read it in the newspaper. You read stories about it. Is there anything new that people have figured out uh, that, that we don't know already? Because it's something that we read about all the time. It's a good question. I unfortunately had a very close friend whose baby passed away aged six months of SIDS just a few weeks ago. Oh. I would say the following, that the incidence of SIDS has dropped dramatically and precipitously over the last decade. The main reason for that was based on studies that came out of New Zealand and Australia where they found <clears throat> placing babies to sleep in a prone, i.e. face-down position, led to an inability of very young children to clear carbon dioxide from their systems. <clears throat> As a result, the American Academy of Pediatrics has taken a stand whereby all babies should sleep face up. And we do that now, <clears throat> this, certainly all my children. This has caused a dramatic decline in SIDS. We believe that to be the case. In addition, we have put a lot of money, a lot of research into SIDS, and we now believe that SIDS is in some way, shape, or form a cardiac event, that once the children are sleeping in the proper position, you've eliminated a lot of these so-called rebreathing problems, asphyxiation, suffocation, etc. And a child dying today of SIDS, more likely than not, has had some type of arrhythmia, a cardiac problem, a heart problem that would have gone under the radar screen and undiagnosed. Uh-huh. Mm. <clears throat> and what, what's your opinion on, on uh, vaccinations as, as a pediatrician? The new HPV uh, is in the news all the time. Uh, flu shots for children. Uh, uh, the new chickenpox booster <clears throat> when everybody thought when the chickenpox shot came out that it would be for life and now they've got a chickenpox booster that people are getting. Uh, whooping cough is now back in the news once again. Uh, <laughs> what, what is your feeling about all of these vaccinations and, and the necessity or, or over, overratedness of them? I think that's an excellent question. In my opinion, vaccinations are one of the probably top three or four advances of modern medicine up there with antibiotics and uh, probably parenteral nutrition, artificial nutrition that help, has helped sustain our population, particularly our children. I feel very, very strongly that vaccinations has gotten a bad rap from some well-intentioned people, particularly there are individuals who have children who have autism, and many in the autistic community have tried to finger vaccinations MMR. as a result. <clears throat> this has been studied extensively, and there is absolutely no scientific evidence whatsoever to show that vaccinations cause autism. In everything that we do, there are risks and benefits. There are no free lunches in anything whatsoever. <clears throat> everything that we do, that includes getting into one's car, crossing the street, flying in an airplane, There are risks and benefits. And giving vaccinations clearly have some risks. The risks are tiny. There is no question that the scientific evidence is overwhelming 
that the benefits of vaccinations far outweigh any risks. Risks do exist. <coughs> Complications do occur. These are extraordinarily rare. The benefit of the vaccinations far outweigh the risks. And by vaccinating our children, we are preventing all of these very much preventable diseases. And these include meningitis, these include whooping cough, these include a host of other things. Even so-called diseases that you or I may have had as children, including chickenpox, there is no question that the vaccination will help and prevent chickenpox. <clears throat> People will say, well, I had chickenpox, I was fine, that's true. But when you accumulate the scientific evidence, the chances, the chances of developing pneumonia, the chances of developing complications of meningitis from the chickenpox are very, very real, and the vaccination can prevent that. Now, like any other field of medicine, these are processes of and in evolution. <clears throat> we continue to test, we continue to do research, and we continue to refine what the vaccinations are all about. I feel a little bit bad, again, as a pediatrician, when children come into the pediatrician's office, they immediately start crying and screaming because they know they're not going to escape without one or more needles. <clears throat> However, there is no question that the prevention is worth a pound of cure, an ounce of prevention, and vaccinations should be given. The last one you mentioned, the new vaccination with the HPV, again, somewhat controversial, <clears throat> but I think in the long run, not knowing what the future has in store for any individual, for any young lady in particular, that I really endorse all the vaccinations which have been, pro been proven scientifically to be efficacious. Great. Now, uh, another one that's always, uh, you know, because I grew up with it, taking children's aspirin. And, of course, nowadays we don't give our children <laughs> aspirin. We give them acetaminophen or, or, or uh, ibuprofen for children, um, uh, sometimes known as Tylenol or Motrin, uh, right. possibly by, by brand names. But, but doing this, has it prevented Ray's syndrome, which was, uh, uh, you know, blamed on aspirin given to children? Again, I think you've hit on a, t a hot topic, an important topic, and there is no question. We don't uh, truly understand the connection, or what we would say in medical terminology, the so-called pathophysiology or link between Rye or Ray syndrome and aspirin, but we know that the link does exist. And we know that once this was discovered and we stopped treating fever with aspirin, the incidence of Rye syndrome has plummeted precipitously to the point where I don't think I have seen a case in 15 years or more. These cases, which were coming every day, which very often were fatal, for the most part, have been wiped out. So this is an excellent example of bringing the research, bringing the research in the laboratory to the bedside and of the benefit of doing that. It's interesting that I now take a children's aspirin every day. I do too. Because do when too. you reach a certain age, it's felt to be preventative in terms of heart disease and stroke. So although I have a soft spot in my heart for St. Joseph's children's aspirin, which I took as a child all the time, but I'm taking them now to make up for all those kids who are not getting them. Very good. I am also, actually. And uh, since my father started, I said I should start too, and I, and I did. Um, and, and then uh, just another brief topic, child safety. We talk about car seats. We talk about uh, lead poisoning from toys. We talk about uh, protection from the sun and, and skin disease and, and, and cancer, uh, melanoma, and things of the, of the sort. Are, are these things uh, on the rise, or are they getting better now that the public is more aware of these problems? I think that a good portion of general pediatric care, again, I'm a subspecialist, but in terms of general pediatric care, there's something called preventative guidance. Any good pediatrician worth his salt today should be spending a portion of every routine or well visit giving the families, giving the parents guidance in terms of what is age appropriate for their children. There is no question every single thing that you mentioned is of critical importance. And again, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. We are tremendously interested in trying to do everything that we can to prevent accidents, not to treat them, not to cure them. Child safety car seats is something, there is no excuse not to have your child in the car seat. We know that under 20 pounds, they should be facing backward. We know that when they're 20 pounds or more, the car seat can be facing forward. And we know that until the age of four or sometimes older, booster. they should be having booster seats. And this has been studied and this has been shown that the incidence of 
severe accidents and injuries to children in automobiles and in motor vehicle accidents has declined precipitously with people following this rules. And I know in my hospital, you cannot take your newborn out of the hospital unless you bring a car seat into the nursery and getting your discharge papers. Well, we have something about car seats for our audience, and we're going to take a look at that uh, to let them know how important uh, car seats are. I'm here with Dr. Phil Caslow. He is a gastroenterologist and a pedi- pediatric gastroenterologist, and what he is sharing with us is so interesting. So stay with us, and we'll be right back. Once they've outgrown their toddler seat, they're still not ready for adult safety belts alone. Four foot nine is the magic number. Until then, kids need a booster seat. Make sure your little pumpkin gets there safely. Visit BoosterSeat.gov. Children can get frightened by what they see and hear on television. You can help them feel better. Right, Elmo? Right. When kids are scared, talking about it helps them feel better, and a big warm hug helps them feel safe. Yeah. and you're watching Taped with Rabbi Doug. Welcome back. We're here on Taped with Rabbi Doug. I'm here with Dr. Philip Caslow. He is a clinical gastroenterologist at Children's Hospital of New York in Manhattan, and he is the director of that uh, uh, department. And uh, I want to uh, thank him again for being with us. We, we talked about all these different safety issues, all these different uh, childhood uh, diseases and pre- preventions of childhood diseases. I want to talk more about your specialty. And can you tell me, there are two, two things that I think come to mind uh, with, uh, with me as a, a school teacher as well that children uh, have that really isn't understood. And one of them is, of course, Crohn's disease and colitis. These two things, I have so many students who are out of school for so many days, and, and, and they tell me that it was just impossible for them to even come to school. And, and nobody really, I think, that doesn't, people know people who have it. Everybody, I think, who knows children, either knows someone who has it or, or has someone in their family that, that has it. But I don't think people really know what it is how it affects these children, what kind of cures or uh, um, medicines to help prevent uh, outbursts of these diseases come along. And the next, the next one is uh, celiac disease, gluten. Can you tell us about these things? Because I know you really are an expert on them. We'll start with Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis fall under the topic or the rubric of what are called inflammatory bowel diseases. Uh, these are what are called, and again, in the medical terminology, thought to be part of a group of so-called Jewish genetic diseases. As I say when I lecture about this topic, I don't know if you used to have Levy's Real Jewish Rye Bread here in the Midwest, but on the East Coast, there used to be a commercial for Levy's Real Jewish Rye Bread, and they used to say, you don't have to be Jewish to love Levy's Real Jewish Rye Bread. You don't have to be Jewish to be afflicted with Crohn's disease or, or ulcerative colitis. However, it is disproportionately found in the Jewish population both Ashkenazic and Sephardic. It doesn't really break down in any of those areas that much. There is a preponderance in the Ashkenazic Jewish population. This was actually traced, often when we think about the Ashkenazic population, we often think more of the Eastern European or Polish and Russian descendants. Actually, it was studied and it was found it was more of the Central European Jews that had more of the people that were afflicted with Crohn's and colitis. But nevertheless, it can afflict anyone at any age. The major ages in which people get it. Again, as a pediatric gastroenterologist, I'm dealing with children. There is a wide group that get it from the age of 15 and on. Then there is another spike in terms of the incidence in the fifth decade of life, age 40 to 40, 40 to 55, more or less. Crohn's disease is not that well understood. Just the mention of the word will send a shiver of fear in the spines of many people, many people who are watching and who who are viewing us. It is, there probably is someone who, out there who either has it themselves or has a relative or a friend or who knows someone who has it. The incidence of Crohn's in the population, the Jewish population, is thought to be as high as 10%. If you have a first-degree relative who has it, meaning a parent, a sibling, who has it, 
then your chances of getting it are probably twice that high, probably go up to about 15%. Crohn's disease is thought to be what we call an autoimmune disease, meaning that for some reason the body attacks itself. As an example, for example in diabetes, we know that the body will attack the pancreas. In arthritis, the body will attack the joint. So in Crohn's disease and colitis, for some reason that we do not understand, it's immunologically based, the body will view the intestine, the lining of the intestine, as a foreign substance and then turn its internal inflammatory mechanisms against the body and cause inflammation. The presentation of Crohn's disease is usually very insidious. It is very often, only in retrospect, will the family, the parent, the grandparent, or the patient themselves realize there was something going on. They can look back often uh, back at a year or more and then begin to realize. Very often the hallmarks of this condition are very vague abdominal pains, but not every child has stomach aches, more or less. These are pains that do not go away. Very often they will be located in the lower right part of the body, the lower right quadrant, we say in medical terminology, the lower right area. Very often these children will be afflicted with diarrhea. Their bowel movements will go from being whatever normal is or was for that child to being rather loose, being more frequent. Occasionally the patient, the child, will have rectal bleeding. Then there are so-called what we call extra-intestinal manifestations of the condition, meaning that sometimes the patient will present with joint pains. Sometimes they'll present with unusual skin rashes. Sometimes they'll present with fevers that we don't really have an explanation for. Okay, sometimes the presentation will be even more subtle. Occasionally the only manifestation or symptom, which I put in quotation marks, would be poor growth or poor development, a child not going into puberty. Sometimes there'll be an unexplained anemia. So these are many of the ways the patient will present. The patient will ultimately be referred to the gastroenterologist. We'll do a thorough history and a thorough physical examination. Does that include endoscopy, colonoscopy? Well, we're not like up to there yet. Uh -huh. That will be the first step. And then we'll do usually a slew of blood tests to start, looking for, number one, anemia. And number two, we'll be looking again for signs of inflammation. It's called an inflammatory bowel condition. And these will include an elevation of certain parameters of the blood, something called the ESR or the sedimentation rate, something called the CRP or C-reactive protein. These are inflammatory markers. You usually see them being elevated. You may see that the patient's blood protein is lower because they've been having diarrhea. And that's the first step. The second step will usually be some type of X-ray, something called a GI series, where the patient will be sent to the X-ray Sweet. Drink barium? They will drink some barium, and this will be a thorough investigation. At that point, your index of suspicion will usually be either high or low, and the next step would be some type of endoscopy. In the present day and age, we'll usually do both an upper endoscopy, where the scope is inserted through the mouth, and we'll examine the esophagus, the stomach, and the small intestine, and then that usually will be followed with a colonoscopy, with the scope being inserted from the bottom, and we'll examine the entire large intestine, and usually the place where the small and large intestine meet, which is called the ileum. And that, with the use of very small biopsies or bites of tissue, will be sent to the laboratory for analysis, and then we will look for the signs and symptoms of the condition. And that is usually what entails in terms of the diagnostic part. And how is it treated? The therapeutic part goes in different stages. And again, what I always tell my patients and I tell families is that, number one, no two patients are alike. Number two, in any given patient, what was true today may not be true six months from now or a year from now. The normal, usual scenario is that after diagnosis, we'll put the patient on some type of anti-inflammatory medication. This may be something like prednisone, which is a steroid, which is useful for the short term, it may be something called azacol or pentassa, which are anti-inflammatory medications which have no cosmetic side effects. Or it may be something such as 
um, imuran, which is a different kind of what we call an anti-metabolite. The bottom line here, again, is that it is an inflammatory condition, and you need to reduce inflammation internally in the body. I would say the overwhelming number of patients will go into remission, and then the natural history of the disease is one of sort of a roller coaster, what we call exacerbations, you get worse, and then remissions. And what our job is as gastroenterologists is to try to get away with those peaks and valleys and try to give the patient the most benefit, again, with the least cure, with the least side effects, with the least cost. Wow, wow. Um, we only have a couple of minutes left, and I really do want to know about gluten. Tell me a little bit about it. Gluten, and okay, I'll be happy to. Gluten is something which has been very much in the news for a variety of reasons, and there's a condition called celiac disease or a gluten enteropathy, meaning a gluten sensitivity or a gluten allergy. I put allergy in quotation marks. It's not the kind of allergy where you'll get bumps or a rash. Again, it is an immunological condition where the body views gluten, or the gluten is the protein in most grains, particularly wheat, in wheat. Wheat spelt, right? Wheat. Mainly wheat, and to a lesser degree, rye and barley, mm -hmm. and to some degree, oats. And the patient who has, again, some type of seemingly genetic susceptibility to this condition, when they take the wheat or the gluten in their diet, they will develop, again, a host of symptoms ranging from stomach pains, and diarrhea, poor growth, anemia, to something where they can be virtually asymptomatic. And I've had that very commonly, where they've been asymptomatic, but a sibling had it. I had a case of identical twins, where one twin had every symptom, and the other twin had no symptoms. And when we tested them, all of their lab tests and ultimately their endoscopies came out the same. And the way we diagnose it is, again, we start with the special blood test, which will test you for the antibodies against gluten. And that will usually be followed with an upper endoscopy, where we go through the mouth, take a small biopsy of the small intestine, and put it under the microscope. And normally, when you have a normal intestine, you have something called villi, which, are, which in Latin means fingers. Right. It looks like finger-like projections. And when you have the gluten problem, these things, these villi will either be shortened or sometimes entirely flat. The great thing about the celiac is that when you go on the diet, the situation is totally reversed. Wow. There's no need for medication. It is something, however, which is a lifetime, lifetime condition. I know so many people who have this allergy, as, as it's called, and look forward to Passover because there are so many potato flour uh, products that are made uh, that are gluten-free and they're able to have baked goods made from potato flour. It's just an amazing yeah, thing. My, my patients will stock up on Passover for virtually the entire year. And interestingly enough, again, in the New York area, we have a bakery which is kosher for Passover, and they learn that because of these patients, that they can do their baking instead of once a year, they do it once a month, so that actually helps them with their overhead, and there's an entire network of people. And the other point I would want to make is that you can have a gluten sensitivity but not have celiac disease. Mm -hmm. You can go for the testing and be negative, however, still be sensitive to gluten. And I very firmly believe that there is, in certain predisposed individuals, a definite reaction to food products containing gluten, which can make them ill. This was written up recently in the New York Times earlier this year about patients who do not have celiac, but who definitely benefit from being gluten-free. Wow. wow. I can't thank you enough for being on the show. Dr. Philip Caslow, thank you. Next time you're in Chicago or maybe within the next few trips, I'd love to have you back because we didn't even touch on anything I really wanted to talk about in depth. I want to thank all of you for being with us. Remember, check out our website, www.tvrabbi.com, where you can also catch us online. And send us an email if you want to get a hold of uh, the doctor and ask him any questions. I'll be happy to forward an email to him at info at tvrabbi.com. Thanks for being with us. Hope to see you next week at this very same time right here on Taped with Rabbi Doug. Shalom. Gonna see Rabbi Doug on the TV tonight.